Okay. So um, I'll introduce you quickly so yeah. our viewers okay. know who you are. This is Professor Rom Harry, distinguished research professor at Georgetown University in Washington, D.C. He wrote Wittgenstein and Psychology, in which he explains why and how the philosophy of Ludwig Wittgenstein is relevant for an understanding of what psychology can explain and do. The people who would be watching this little podcast probably mainly are people in w working in organizations, um, some business consultants, organizational psychologists, um, also managers, and um, they're doing things like team trainings or conflict resolution, designing performance improvement tools or coaching. Um, how do you think these kinds of people could benefit from um, knowing anything about Wittgenstein? Well, one of Wittgenstein's main points is that um, every activity we engage in is controlled to some extent by the language that we use in order to engage in it. And this language is always rather specific to the situations in which we, we are. We frequently misunderstand it. We try to theorize about it and get away from the practical activities in which it's involved. So one of the things that we learn from Wittgenstein is to be very, very, very careful about the way we understand the language we're using. As long as we're using it, it's okay. Start thinking about it as you might in a business school or somewhere like that, in a training program, then you're almost certain to fall into all kinds of traps. Wittgenstein will help you to escape those. <laughs> I think I agree very much with that. Um, um, like in, in many of the current models of business consultancy and human resource development, um, you have things like internal states, motivation, value systems. I think these are a bit like these traps that you just were talking about. Um, uh, what is the, dis the, the take of discursive psychology on this? Well, Wittgenstein and people like who think like him, and there, and there are many others, I mean, he's just a kind of leading figure. I find the whole idea of trying to explain what people do by reference to internal states or something like that really quite uh, implausible. Um, goes back to Vygotsky, the great Russian psychologist, who asks us to look into the relationships between people, the way that those develop as ways in which our, our cognitive skills grow, always in, con always in conversation or in interrelationship with someone else. So instead of looking inside the human being for the origins and explanation of the way we think, according to Vygotsky and myself, people like that, we look outside to say, well, who are you interacting with? Who were your parents? What was the culture in which you were brought up? That's where we'll find the processes. Quite a lot of the time, the processes are never completed by an individual. We've done research here in this university on the way memory is created collectively. Even when you're remembering all by yourself, you're nevertheless remembering as if you're in a collective, a group of people of some sort. So that's the, the kind of thing that's making decisions. It's more the work of a committee than it is of an individual person. Even when that person is all by themselves, the way they're thinking in decision making is the way that they have learned to think in the context of other people when they're making decisions collectively how the family make decisions, how the family remember. Family becomes an absolutely central unit in all of this. Would that also be true for um, organizations and, um, for, for lack of a better word, your socialization into organizations? Sure. Well, an organization is rather like a family. I mean, a good organization. I mean, one that has kind of the relationships between people are constructed. <laughs> Um, in that kind of thing. The, the, of course, the exactly the same thing is, is, uh, is going on. There's a collective activity. And then someone can go away in the corner and think for him or herself. But the way they're thinking is, in, is the, essentially they think something that they've derived from the system in which they're, they're, they're involved. So instead of following the cognitive science route, looking inside to neuropsychology or something like that, we had, uh, our thought is look outside to so you could, you could say something like the action is in the interaction rather than in the person uh, exactly, or in the employee exactly. thinking 
emoting, reasoning, deciding are all interactions, primarily interactions rather than personal actions. They may look like personal actions, but when you do a thorough study of how they operate, you find they are ultimately basically interactions. So in, um, instead of looking at the motivation level in a team, in in inverted commas, which doesn't exist really. Um, what could a business consultant who is maybe trying to help a team on an issue like motivation do instead? Well, we simply don't believe in motivation as some kind of hidden internal force. Uh, according to the, this, uh, our, our point of view, a motive is something that you tell someone when you want to account for what you're doing. So, and uh, it's, 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 it's a serious mistake in psychology to read that back inside the individual as some kind of force driving to do something. Your motive is whatever it happens to suit you to tell the person. Goodness knows why anybody does something, but we can certainly find that constructing a world in which what they're doing makes sense or is justified, that's their motive. So this goes back to sociologists like C. Wright Mills, for example, the person who first made very clear this idea that motivation is something that is said. Um, Wittgenstein also in various places, the same sort of idea. There's no engine inside driving it, there's no little forces inside. <laughs> there's, there's conventions of discourse. So um, <coughs> in the convention of discourse, when, when a um, client of mine tells me, I have a problem with the motivation in my team, mm. I would have to translate that into the function of what, what is he trying to do by telling me this? Well, he's trying to tell you that the way the team are explaining what they're doing is not according to his lights what, a, what, what, what it should be. So, you see, the whole idea is that, that why people do things is primarily because they've committed themselves to doing them. So it's looking at action as going forward rather than being driven forward. So if you're talking about team motivation, what you have to do is to give the team a discursive practice, which is all the time drawing them forward. So my motivation is to get this thing done, rather than the idea of some kind of force pushing me. So it's all a matter of getting people to commit themselves to doing stuff. And then, of course, the social order drives or forces people, doesn't drive people, calls out, requires people to fulfill those commitments. So intentionality is exactly the same thing. We take the same view about intentions. Intentions are not forces I've conjured up in myself to make me do things. They're telling people what I've committed myself to doing. So if I say, I intend to go downtown, I'm not telling you about some hidden psychological force. I'm making you a promise. Mm -hmm. So if I don't go downtown, you can accuse me of misleading you, right? Mm -hmm. Not of being mistaken about my internal forces. <laughs> there are no internal forces. <laughs> Thank you. That's, I think, very, very enlightening. Um, uh, if um, maybe to change the topic a little bit, um, what, are, what are you currently working um, on and um, what is fascinating for you at the moment? Well, I've been doing a, a lot of work in recent years on the role of emotion displays mm -hmm. and how emotion words are related to those. Uh, the idea being that <coughs> everybody has a, a number of simple bodily reactions <coughs> and then in any particular culture those become associated with a vocabulary and that vocabulary differs from culture to culture. So as you develop your, these simple reactions become reframed, restructured, etc., insofar as they appear in the public world of other people, so uh, being angry, being fearful, and so on, these aren't anything significant until they appear as public displays. And those public displays are themselves within the framework of the vocabulary that you learn so you learn, uh, in Spanish, for, for example, you have two words, celos and invidio, meaning jealous and envious. They are not related to each other in the same way as envy and jealousy are related in English. 
So, if you ask how these how these relations how these ideas of these interpersonal relationship being envious of someone being jealous of someone work out in Spain, they work out differently. We've done a study here with between Georgetown and Madrid on the subject of people feeling that life that things are not fair. Quite different in Spain from 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 the U.S. People of the same age and social background quite different, the sense of, of outrage at being badly treated. That, that emotion is not at all the same. In, in the US it's to do with equity, in Spain it's to do with honour. The whole structure of the emotions are, are, are different. So that's the kind of thing I've been doing quite a lot about recently. That's very, very fascinating. I can see a lot of um, interesting applications that this might have in the in the future. Oh yes, indeed. Yes, 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 yeah. yes, yes. Yeah. Um, what um, maybe one future-oriented question? Where do you think um, philosophy of psychology is going to be, say, in ten, fifteen years from now? Well, I think as time has gone by, what we've seen is the more is the really the disappearance of the last traces of behaviorism. And so we're left, and I think what's continually be on the rise in the last 10, 15 years is the sort of stuff I'm talking about, discursive psychology, focusing on, on, on language use in everyday life and studying that as the topic of psychology. At the same time, neuropsychology is also developing very rapidly. And we need to have some sort of notion of how those two things are related. Mm -hmm. Now, I've just published a textbook trying to a book for students to see how they are related. The idea being this, that when we're doing all these things linguistically and symbolically, then we need some tools to do them with. It's like if you want to play tennis, tennis is a cultural artifact, but you have to have a racket and a, and a, a, mm -hmm. and a court to do it with. Same way, when you're performing all these activities we, we're talking about, you have to have a brain, vocal cords, and so on. So you can think of the neuropsychologist as studying the tools and the discursive psychologist as studying the tasks. So we, the one is telling us how the tools work, the other is telling us what the tasks are. So it's one thing to study spades, it's another thing to study digging. And it, but you need spades to dig. <coughs> and would there then be an overarching kind of um, science? Yes, it, would, it wouldn't be a, it would be a, I like to call it a hybrid, mm -hmm. because the methodologies in these two sides of psychology are rather different. So, but they, but they certainly need each other. So instead of thinking there'll be a single psychology, either trying to reduce it to neuropsychology or trying to reduce it to linguistic studies, what we really have to bear in mind, it should be some sort of hybrid. We're never going to get a single psychological science. It's like chemistry and physics. They're a hybrid. Mm -hmm. Chemistry has its own ways of doing things, physics. But anything that happens in chemistry depends upon physical processes. And, in a, and one thing they would then have to agree, agree on is a, is a um, um, common methodology or common... Um, no, there's, not not a method com there's not a common methodology. That's just the point. Maybe a common philosophy of science, then, is common what I mean. Common philosophy of science, yes, that's right. So we're interested in meanings and how they are realized. But there's no common methodology, because in neuropsychology you're doing experimental studies. In discursive psychology you're doing analytical studies. So one of the things is, one of the ideas here, or one of the pr programmatic ideas, is to stop psychologists wasting their time on exper psychological experiments and get to work on studying and ana analyzing real life episodes in which people do things and bring things about. And then the neuropsychologists can be doing their experimental program mm -hmm. on their side of the story. So it's really a hybrid methodologically as well as a hybrid technically. And from a philosophy of science perspective, they would um, um, deem the same things as valid and the same things as not valid. For instance, a psychological experiment, if it's if it's not philosophically correct. Well, psychological, yeah, psychological exper neuropsychological experiments rely upon causal relations. Analyc uh, analysis of discursive practices rely on meaning relations. 
So there's laws of nature in neurophysiology, how chem the chemicals in the brain behave, for example, and there's rules of life, cultural rules, mm -hmm. in the discursive side. So one thing is about causes and laws, the other is about meanings and rules. So both have an element of generality, but the gen there's no norms in neuropsychology, but the rules of life are normative in, the, in psychology, in discursive psychology. What we're studying are the norms of life, how people think they're supposed to behave. Ah, okay, thank you. I th think I understand that um, better now. Okay. Good. Well, thank you very much for talking to That's us, awesome. and um, I think everybody will find this very fascinating. Um, very, very uh, pleased to have this opportunity with you. <laughs> okay. Good. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And of course, Wittgenstein wrote his work in German, so that's uh, something that uh, you can take advantage of as your mother tongue. <laughs> yes, of course. Okay. Bye bye. Thank you.